Parvin. Um, this is the fourth lecture of the uh, Lighthouse Studio Series. Um, Arthur is a designer with London based Studio 00. Zero. Uh, although he trained in architecture, uh, his work extends outside the traditional framework, um, looking at the economic, social, and uh, technological system behind it. Alistair joined Studio 00 in 2010 um, as a designer and researcher. Uh, previously, he has worked with uh, Roger Harper and Partners and as a freelance designer for Field and Click, Bradley Architects. His work has been shortlisted for bronze and silver medals for River Crescent uh, medals. And yes, he was listed as one of the UK top six graduating students in the Building Design Class 2009 awards. He's the lead author of The Right to Build, which is an ongoing research project exploring the UK housing crisis, the democracy deficit in planning, and how citizens could become a mass house building movement. This work uh, has been um, awarded River President's Award in uh, 2012. Alistair is also a co founder of WikiHouse, um, an open source construction system aimed at radically democratizing the ability to make houses. Uh, he's a co editor of Mayshift, an open content fanzine about architecture, economics, technology, and society. He has also written for Architects Journal uh, and lectured in the University of Greenwich. Uh, his team has won a number of international uh, architectural competitions, most recently the Heathrow third runway competition for Greenpeace. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Alice Park. Well, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to come up and uh, speak in this uh, extraordinary building. I'm sure you get better hearing that, but it's cool. Um, I, I, you know, the conventional format for uh, these sorts of talks is, uh, in my experience, that uh, you come up and kind of present a load of polished answers, uh, you know, in, in a very kind of attractive way. I think, A, I haven't been around long enough to do that um, and don't have any answers. Um, but B, I wasn't sure that would be very useful. I, I think the most interesting, valuable thing about architecture is that no one really knows what it's for. Uh, but also the most problematic thing about architecture is that no one really knows what it's for. Um, so the other aspect of this is that um, the most difficult questions which architecture has to ask itself right now are the questions so naive and obvious, things like who pays for it, that no one dares ask them, particularly in architecture schools, because in this kind of in sort of elevated environment of tutors and everything like that, it's very like no, you you know you're stupid if you ask questions like who pays for it or why do we need this. Um, so in a way, um, a sort of this kind of idea of architecture is the answer to what is the question is an opportunity to talk about this, but also I want to have complete free license on heckling stupid questions, rude questions. Hopefully I will cause some arguments, um, and that's good. Uh, so, yeah. Please feel free to heckle at any time. So, if architecture is the answer, what was the question? Like, actually, when you look out there, it turns out there's no shortage of really, really interesting and crucial design questions uh, that need to be addressed. Um, some we're very, very familiar with, and we're all familiar with things like addressing climate change in a world where the population is going to increase to 11 billion. Uh, some of them far more niche to do with our own minds, data freedom, all kinds of things like that. But these are design problems, and they're being widely recognised by corporations, governments, everybody as design problems. And yet architecture, I don't know about you, I've always struck, it's always struck me that architecture seems to be incredibly peripheral to all of these questions. It seems to be very powerless and have very little engagement in shaping these things. And um, I'd like to know why. I mean, you, <laughs> sorry about this. It goes on quite a long time. This brain thing. Um, so the first thing we have to ask ourselves in uh, asking this question of what is architecture the question is we have to dispel some myths. The first myth is this one, which is this idea that um, 
architecture somehow dates back. It's this ancient practice that goes back to ancient Rome and ancient Greece. It's all bollocks. Um, actually, the truth is that architecture the profession as we know it emerged sometime around the 17th and 18th century um, as a sort of gentleman's hobby. It just so happened that, that those gentleman's hobby was going over to ancient to Greece and Italy and nicking shit and copying it. Um, and, and of course, they had a really direct interest, a reason to be interested in what the architecture of empire looked like because they happened to be building one at the time. So um, this, and, and what they did is they wrote themselves a sort of creation story like Adam and Eve. Uh, they wrote themselves a backstory that said, oh, look, Vitruvius used this word architecture, let's call ourselves architects. Um, so that's the kind of first myth. The second myth, which is probably the most prevalent one, I've seen it prevalent in this building, uh, so, uh, oh, well, actually the other building, uh, you know, uh, already today, and throughout the whole of public and architecture is this myth that architects make buildings. Now, this is rubbish for a number of reasons. Um, the first most obvious one is that actually architects are responsible for only about 2% of all the buildings that ever get made. Uh, that, you know, most buildings we have, architects have nothing to do with. Um, the second thing is if you ask any practicing architect, even the most mainstream conservative architect, uh, as particularly a director or a leader of those practices, what they actually spend their time doing day to day, only a tiny percentage of their time is actually designing buildings. It's conversations, negotiating, all kind of, you know, it's on the phone. Most of the buildings are actually designed through email inboxes. And the third reason, of course, is that a building is a complete artificial construct. It's the fact that you're, you're doing a bunch of resource activities for a particular budget within a particular red line defined by law called property ownership. Um, and so that's a really big part of our kind of approach and, and thinking. An example of that um, is actually a project we... we we self-initiated a few years ago, which was called Scale Free Schools, where the big political debate at that time was about this idea of schools. And on one side, you had Labour saying, no, we're going to spend loads and loads of money making uh, these big new schools for the future, um, and if we're really good, we'll get Zaha Hadid to make them a funny shape. Um, and, uh, and then on the other side, you had Tories saying, no, we're not going to be able to do any schools, or you can live in a porter cabin. And both of these seem pretty unattractive offers to me for two reasons. One, if you build the building, it was a kind of this sort of what's called the cells and bells model, this Victorian factory idea of education. Um, uh, but also this problem that you spend £30 million building this asset called a building, but if you actually factor in the evening times, uh, the weekends, and the holidays, your actual usage of that asset is only 16% of the time. Your school building is sitting empty 85% of the time. That's not a clever way to spend money on education. Um, so we explored this model called Scale Free Schools where we said, actually, if you look at the latent capacity in neighbourhoods, particularly shrinking cities like Glasgow, um, the capacity to, um, if you like, turn a neighbourhood into a school using existing spaces but also existing institutions and existing resources. Um, and practically, how would you begin to do this, looking at issues like security and due diligence, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, so the, the kind of net kind of gist here is, to quote Cedric Price, as I almost always do, um, you know, his thing, which is we, mu we should be much less interested in the design of bridges and more interested in how to get to the other side. That means we should be much less interested in designing schools and much more interested in designing education, much less interested in the design of hospitals, more interested in the design of health. Uh, and that's literally true. I mean, if you think about a, per a society with a perfect healthcare system, it's not one with many hospitals, it's one with no hospitals. Um, so that's the kind of first thing that I think was sort of going, uh, the kind of myth or thing that's going awry with architecture uh, and why we seem to be so peripheral. But I think th there's another thing which is, comes down to the straightforward economics of architecture. So I kind of did this exercise um, in my head. If you look up on the RIBA what your expected salary is when you graduate from part two, um, you should be expecting to earn uh, £24,000. Now, if you put that globally... Uh, in terms of if you line up the whole world's population in, in order of income, um, that would already put us in the top 1.95% richest people on earth. Now, any of you, have you ever worked on an, or no, I'm sure you have occasionally, but pro bono work, but generally in your practices, have you consistently worked on projects where your client was poorer than you? No. Clients are always richer than us. So effectively, what we're saying is that in order to hire an architect for the several weeks and months required to do a project, the only people who can genuinely afford to hire an architect are this tiny 1% of the world's population. 
And that plays out across many different economies, by the way, but I won't bore you with all the graphs. The reason why we forget this, why we don't think of ourselves this way, and we all kind of know this, right? We all know that when you pick up glossy magazines, it's like a villa for somebody. You know, pick up the fight on Atlas of Architecture, it's like, you know, uh, Philip Meyer doing a villa for a millionaire in the middle of nowhere. Um, The reason why we forget it is because actually the times in history that have completely defined architecture's identity have been the times when through completely external political and economic reasons, um, the 1% of organisations and wealthy individuals have built on behalf of everybody else, and particularly housing. Um, Obviously that began uh, at scale with the philanthropists when there was this incredible urban deprivation. Um, uh, later, of course, and most famously, the welfare state, you know, up to even the 70s, over 50% of all the architects employed in the UK were employed directly by the state um, as part of this kind of utopian project um, to, to, to deliver housing. Uh, and, of course, Glasgow knows that well. Um, uh, then we went through this kind of weird period from the 70s and 80s where architecture's question was, meh, like, whatever... No, I'm an artist. I don't have to answer a question. I'm completely pursuing my own whims. I don't have to be useful to society. I get to do whatever the hell I want. Um, and if, if the client doesn't like the shape that they then have to end up living in because it's a funny shape or the green glass on the facade breaks, then it's stuck. <laughs> um, but of course, what was really happening, what, the question that architecture was actually working on during that period was real estate. Actually, what was driving all that, uh, that age of icons and funny shapes um, was this, this real estate bubble. That was actually who was, who was paying us with these speculative developers who were building these things so they could sell these real estate things, which we would get mortgages and buy, and they would make their money. And, um, you know, Indy, uh, my boss, puts it rather brilliantly, architecture's business for the last few decades has been creating assets and inflating assets. And the inflating bit is the, the Bill Bio effect where, again, you get an archi- a famous architect um, to come in and make a funny turd thing, um, and then and, and, and all the media flock around and say, isn't this incredible? Um, and that's actually what's going on, and I, I wish more architects could be more honest about it, actually. Um, it's not a bad thing, it's fine. Um, Glasgow, by the way, is much cleverer than all these people. Instead of spending millions of pounds building the Bill Bio Guggenheim, they just put a cone on a statue's head, and it has the same effect. <laughs> um... And this is a painful reality for us to deal with. That Le Corbusier's idea, when we've been doing all these housing projects, Le Corbusier's idea of what the house was was a machine for living. Actually, Cass Gilbert, the architect of uh, many skyscrapers in New York, had it better, which is that houses, de facto, that their purpose is a machine to make the land pay. That is the design intent. And that is why, when you went out to practice and you worked in commercial practices, some of you would have been frustrated by the fact that the develop- your client kept saying, make the ceilings lower, take the balconies off, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's what's going on there. Um, now, you know, that plays out. Um, for better or for worse, it comes around and it crashes. But it, fundamentally, what hasn't changed um, through all of those eras, whether it's the welfare state or the real estate bubble, is that we only work for the 1%. I think... Um, I mean, that, this, by the way, I won't go on too long. This is a kind of basic history of housing in the UK over the last few years. This is the total amount of supply and who was providing it. This is the key graph here, which is this line, which was this massive inflation in house prices. This is where our money came from. All, uh, if you're an architect employed in the last 10 years, I almost guarantee you this is where your money came from. Because new labour hooked all our develop, develop, delivery of everything, from schools to you name it, off the back of uplift through um, housing and price inflation. And it was inflation. It wasn't growth. Just because the middle classes get to say their house went up in value, actually all that means is if your house went up in value, your next house just halved in size. Like, we think this is good for us, but it's not. It's a massive kind of myth of economics, and everybody from the left and the right is waking up to it. This is a brilliant statistic from Shelter, which pointed out that if chicken in the supermarket had inflated by the same amount as housing since 1971, chicken today would cost us 50 quid. And so how is architecture, architectural culture, um, this community of designers, how does it react to that? It's sort of split two ways. Well, there's another way, which is the kind of the Bartlett way, sort of trout farms on Mars, as I call it. But, um, but actually, it's kind of split in two halves. 
One way is to go into this kind of reactionary uh, conservative position, um, which it, these are the sort of people you'll hear using words like this, which don't mean anything, by the way. Materiality is a made-up word. It doesn't mean anything. Um, I know, argue it with me afterwards. Um, uh, and these are also people as well who are saying, oh, hand drawings, I love doing hand drawings, which, which is a way of saying, I believe in a Victorian labour model. You know what I mean? So I'll actually, you know, if you want to do hand drawings, it's a way of saying I'm going to need an even richer client who's prepared to pay me to spend the time doing it by hand. Um, I don't get me wrong, I love hand drawings, but be an artist. Um, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm all about craft, but there are many modes of craft. The other side of it is this kind of critical side, this kind of, which I, I guess is slightly closer to my heart, but equally frustrating, which is this sort of, a lefty sort of alternative or social architecture movement. Social architecture is in a logical term because of course all architecture is social. Um, and in a way, though, both of these are equally conservative because none of them really engage with the real economics of, of what's going on. These guys will just say, oh, we're going to transgress against the normative instead of just actually maybe we could be part of inventing what the new normal is. Um, and neither of them really engage with the economics, and I thought this is a beautiful kind of a cartoon of that, the problem with activism, which is the, those fantastic V for Vendetta masks being made by a sweatshop in China. Um, so we're back at this kind of square one position. I think the only structural way that we're going to begin to address both our, the, the struggles facing our own business model, the struggles facing our own ability to be useful in society and if you like, the ethical dilemma that we seem to be on the wrong side of democracy, um, is somehow to try and make our client, for the first time ever, the, not just the 1%, but the 20%, the 30%, the 50%, the 100%. Architecture has never done it, so don't feel a burden of the... Um, uh, what, what that actually means on a day-to-day -day level is think quite hard knows about the transaction costs of design. So my jokes about hand drawings are only half jokes. Um, Fundamentally, it's saying that if you're going to earn your £24,000 over a year, are you going to have it from one client with a lot of money or many clients with a little bit of money? Now, anyone who's worked in an architecture office for a bit of time will tell you this is completely untenable. Um, so we actually have to really think about the way that we're operating. This is kind of... I'm, I'm reappropriating the idea of architectural scale here, as you can see. Like, you know. So... What this leads us on to is having investigated our own sort of business uh, economics is the economics that we're part of. And this is one of those dumb, naive questions that is the most important question. There is not a single question relating to the design of buildings or cities, whether it's sustainability, density, form, materials, anything, labour. Um, there's not a single question that isn't essentially underpinned by this question or transformed by this question, which is who is it who actually makes cities? Um, this is not a blank page. This is a graph of all the houses built in the UK in 2006. Along the x-axis is all the people who made one, and a pixel per house. And along the y-axis is how many they made. It's such a sharp power law that it looks like the page is blank, and I have to do that to see the top of it. In that year, more than 50% of all the houses in the whole of the UK were made by just 10 companies. And the interesting thing is, almost regardless of ideology, whether it's the state or the market, fundamentally, since the Industrial Revolution, the, the uh, way the development model behind housing hasn't really changed that much. The fundamental idea is that the only people who can develop housing at scale are um, all pri professional organisations or corporations building on our behalf. Um, so instead of what you intuitively think, which is 30 people come together... Uh, they decide how they want to live and then they buy, they pay someone to build them a house or 30 houses. Um, we do it rather backwards, where of course, and this is kind of the dumb, obvious stuff, we know this, right? Where we get one person with a single chunk of finance to buy a whole site and they get a design made for a, a sort of planning commission based on this kind of imaginary one size fits all human being, whoever that is, which is becoming increasingly untenable as well. Um, and they, get, they, they do a planning application on it. And of course, form follows finance is the general rule. So if you do everything through a big monolithic chunk of finance, surprise, surprise, you get big monolithic chunks of buildings. It's, it, and, and it's amazing, by the way, how many designers or architects you'll see calling most housing bad design, 
And I, I, mean, I did a whole thing on this saying it's not actually bad design, it's good design, but to a completely different set of economic values than the, things, the ones we want to be working for. And then they divide them up into housing. They commission uh, professional contractors um, to build it, and uh, they might have an overrun, and you might end up having to inhabit the building early. Um, uh, now, of course, in that context, you've created a situation where if you have an inflating land market, um, it doesn't matter if you give a developer... What the developer wants to make is real estate. So if you give them a technology that enables them to build half the price, they'll just go, great, they'll double our profits. They'll still sell to the, for the same price. So there's absolutely no incentive for them to make the houses bigger or to think through what more a house could be doing for us. So it's completely logical for them to say, actually, you know, I'll, I'll take insulation out of the walls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the only person who ever has a real financial in interest in real sustainable energy buildings is the person who's going to be paying the heating bills. And yet they're the only people who we don't ask to commission our buildings. Um, and, by the way, this isn't controversial. Uh, this is completely established. In 2007, there was a government report called the Calcutt Review, which is of how, written by a house-building industry professional. And it made it absolutely clear. It said, in the current market, there is absolutely no incentive for us to invest in quality. In other words, all the things that governments, designers and citizens, architects, believe is good about housing, community, flexibility, quality, sustainability, affordability, we see them as costs. And we will not provide them unless we absolutely have to. And that's why, at the peak of a boom, uh, the UK found itself building the, sec the second smallest houses in the whole of Europe. And, and we call it wealth. And of course, uh, it, it, the result is we all end up being hefted with a huge amount of uh, mortgage debt and living in slightly isolated little flats, which then get foreclosed. And this is literally what's playing out in our cities and what has been playing out in cities. I mean, this looks like it could be kind of Eastern Bloc or something. It's not. It's the Olympic Park. That's literally what, you know, the, the form that gets resolved. The irony, by the way, is that all the design professionals who worked on these sorts of buildings all live in West London in the lovely fine-grained streets um, of Fulham and things. Um, or North London, more likely. Um, and by the way, this is also the development model that we're trying to export onto an urbanising world. This is um, Kilamba in Angola, where Chinese financial capital has parachuted in and it's built a completely new city from scratch that makes kind of Plan Voisin or something like that look quite sort of tame by comparison. Um, and the amazing thing is, uh, it's completely empty because no one can afford the more. You need to pay $75,000 to buy a flat. So it's completely empty. And they pay these gardeners to go and tend all these gardens, so weird non spaces in between. They, they, they pay all the gardeners to go around gardening, and there's this brilliant BBC thing where they go up and say, so, uh, do you like it here? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's no crime. <laughs> um, and and uh, they, well, where do you live? Oh, I live in the slum down the road. So actually what happens is the reality of urbanisation, the city of the future, actually looks like this. They're self-made cities, not these kind of real estate cities. And there's this massive disjunction for me. Because we fundamentally don't have a development model for making this kind of development a sustainable form of development, a sustainable, legitimate form of development that is, uh, you know, has institutions, has infrastructure, etc. This, you know, governments can't recognise this at the moment. So there's a fundamental problem in here, right? Which is the whole model of urban development. Everyone is telling us that the world is urbanising, and yet fundamentally there's a democracy deficit in the way that we're producing. And there's an increasing awareness that planning and development is something done to people, not by them. And that things like consultation are increasingly inadequate as, as means to mitigate this, and certainly not market uh, competition. So this is... Um, and it, this, by the way, is completely regardless of ideology. So uh, this is in China, where the owner of this building refused to sell their house for the construction of a motorway, so the government just built the motorway anyway. Uh, and, and of course this puts also urban space issues, these questions of the commons, right at the heart of political discourse. This is, uh, of course, um, Tahrir Square. Um, is that, that's right, isn't it, in Turkey? Um, no, that was Egypt. Yeah, no, so this is the Turkish one. Um, that, uh, which was, uh, actually began, what triggered that was a debate about trying to build a mall on a public park. Um, 
And actually, we experience this in our own environments, not just in the small the sort of planning disputes, but in these big questions of, um, you know, almost anyone says, actually, wind turbines look all right until they want to build them by their house. So there's this fundamental mismatch in the idea of democracy, which is uh, we're going to build this by your house, but you're not going to get any benefit. You're not going to be a shareholder. In, you're not going to get money. You're not going to get cheaper energy as a result. So, of course, people are going to be against it. Um, and underlying all that, there are big things, big questions like land monopoly and, and, and on all that, but fundamentally underlying it was the industrial assumption that actually it's simply not possible for a planner to work with 100 amateurs. It's simply not possible for 100 amateurs, if you like, to efficiently procure and commission their own neighbourhood. And I think that's now wrong. The technology is changing. Um, we know this, right, because we've already seen it through the last few years of the, 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 uh, this idea of the long tail, from the few professional providers to the many small um, participants. Um, technology fundamentally changes our ability to do this. And this has begun to spread... Um, into the realm of cities and things like Airbnb. Which, I mean, now I think I'm right in saying Airbnb is now globally one of the biggest hotels in the world, as it were. And the interesting thing is, these systems not only are, are quantitatively comparable with, uh, with, with these sort of systems, but actually they have a fundamentally different quality to them. Which is the moment you stay, when you go in an Airbnb and, and you stay in a 14th century castle you suddenly look back at hotels and they just look like battery farms. And there's, there's some other interesting things here in the sense of what this graph actually looks like is highly monetized corporations, um, a, a big bulk of, of professionals, monetized professionals, but fundamentally small companies, and then this long tail of amateurs who are not necessarily doing it out of altruism, but they're simply doing it for themselves to address their own needs. Um, and, of course, the, one of the big shifts to where this is following on is this thing that's been termed the third industrial revolution, which is radically dropping prices and opening IP around um, digital manufacturing tools like 3D printers and CNC machines. Um, so, you know, the quote we always use on this is a John Maynard Keynes one, we think, which is, it's easier to ship recipes than cakes and biscuits. And what's interesting about that is it's simultaneously completely obvious and yet not how our, how our industrial economy works. At the moment we get people in black polo necks sitting in Shoreditch to design products and we send them over to a sweatshop in China where we can get the cheapest labour to make them and we ship them all the way back again and, and then we're, we're consumers again at the other end. And the, 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 the promise, if you like, of digital technology is it fundamentally changes that chain. Now that in itself is not an industrial revolution. It will simply mean that you know, maybe you download your iPhone 20. But, you, you know, actually what it does is it creates a world in which the, the recipe is simultaneously super valuable and yet wants to be free. Now, expect legal battles. Um, but this is potentially industrial revolution, which is it means for the first time we can create open source hardware um, completely shared so that anyone can get access to a design uh, for a thing and, and access it and replicate it and make it for themselves. Um, and that's, that's, that's really kind of interesting. If you look at open source software, there's now an open source software equivalent for pretty much every major piece of software, commercial software out there. Imagine if the same were to happen for stuff. Um, and it also changes the fundamental economics of production away from this assumption that one size fits all is the only economic way of doing things. So a world where potentially products can begin to be more like Darwin's finches in the sense that they can adapt and evolve to local context, local needs, local economies, etc., and that, of course, is fundamentally the kind of premise behind this experiment we began called WikiHouse. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with uh, it at all or come across it. Basically, we're just beginning to try out that same idea for one particular way of making housing. Um, so we've made this kind of online uh, free commons or repository from which you can download um, structures. Uh, in this case, we're, we're using SketchUp, but I'll show you where we're moving after SketchUp just because it's relatively free and easy to use. And made this plugin where at a click of a switch you can generate essentially um, a set of cutting files. It's still very ropey, the software, so you can't quite do it at the click of a switch yet. Um, uh, which are your kind of raw information um, to print out the parts from a standard sheet material like plywood on a CNC machine, which are these machines. Actually, they've been around for ages, they're just more and more widely available. Um, and uh, you know, all, every part can be numbered, uh, etc. So what you end up with is this big kind of bespoke Lego or IKEA kit, effectively. 
Um, and we've, what we've been doing over the last sort of couple of years is slowly trying to, you know, find a way to finance and ourselves to go through this project, but um, developing and honing this, this hardware system um, so that you can take those parts and a, a very small team of people with no construction skills necessarily whatsoever can just come together with their friends and very quickly they can um, uh, build those frames. And they're designed always thinking through, like, so we can take off considering health and safety, you can take off issues like scaffolding all the way through. Um, so you don't need uh, bolts or things like that. The whole thing is done by wedge and uh, peg connections. Um, and, yeah, you can build them very quickly. And then equally, uh, making this an open modular system um, so that uh, taking the same approach to services inside so that you can essentially allow users for the first time to uh, hack their services. This is the house we're developing for the UK. And this is just a video of um, one of those uh, structures which we did in New York, weirdly, in, in, in for an event um, that sort of popped up. Um, and the whole thing was built in a day and a half. One of the interesting things about this is when we focus on technology, we're always trying to go sort of higher and faster. And we're obsessed with actually lowering thresholds, which are time, cost, skill... Um, and carbon, always trying to design down those equations. And so one of those, there's actually a concept in Japanese for this called sort of poker yoke, which is sort of trying to idiot-proof parts, so trying to make it impossible to get wrong, um, so that essentially you can have a level of site organisation equivalent to a piss-up on a, in a brewery, and it will still just go together. Um, and there are other aspects to that as well, which are, um, for example, all the, none of the pieces are so huge that um, your sort of average able-bodied female can't lift them, which means for the first time, construction might not just be a, a man's game. Um, and this, so we put that up in about a day and a half, and this uh, we were particularly proud of because it came down in three hours, um, which is pretty cool. And so what we've developed is this chassis system, and we're currently in the process of taking this all the way through to a complete, very high-energy performance, low-cost home. Um, and that home I showed you before, we're conservatively targeting that to be a 50k build cost, but it's very, very high energy performance, etc. Um, the actual structural build cost is tiny, it's 20k. Uh, this is a, a one which we'll be building in spring um, in Scotland, just in Argyll, which is quite fun. Um, now, the SketchUp thing I showed you earlier, this, again, this lowering thresholds also is our ability to lower thresholds not just by... Um, being lazy like foxes, i.e. going and getting something that already works that's shared under an open license and adapting it, but actually, um, and not just in the way that we build the things, but actually in the design process itself. And frankly, it annoys the hell out of me that parametric design has been abused by architects for the last 10 years or so to make funny-shaped hotels in Dubai, when actually the real potential of that, this technology is to, again, radically lower thresholds. Um, so we can do... In a way, and this is the, the challenging aspect of this, um, we can do stages, you know, D to K in a few minutes, potentially. Um, so this is an in-browser parametric tool we're developing. This is not the house. This is another a desk product, which we developed in a system project called OpenDesk, um, where this is all in-browser. You can just say what the shape of your desk is. You can position the legs, um, and you can adjust the height and the thickness of everything like that, and then you just click and it generates your cutting files. Um, at, at the very end. So what we can begin to um, imagine here is that for the first time, it becomes possible to, if you like, legitimise the idea of uh, citizens making for themselves as a legitimate form of development, a very high-performance, high-quality um, development. So imagine uh, we took that same site that cost £30 million, and instead of um, get, selling it to one very rich person, we sold it to... Um, 30 ordinary people and they came together and they developed not a complete design because they tear each other's you know research shows that they tend to hate each other you know tear each other's heads off um, but actually what they could develop is again potentially through parametric uh, a parametric tool like that they could develop a set of basic outline rules for the neighbourhood and, and that can get passed we have the legislation to do this called an LDO local development order which is like a, a, a community permitted development rights. You've heard of general permitted development rights. It's community permitted development rights. It says, as long as you stay within the rule, you don't need to apply for planning permission. So suddenly it becomes viable for a planning authority to see this as, you know, 
workable instead of having 100 amateurs on the phone. And those rules can be about more or less anything you want. Um, they can't, uh, planning law, law says they can't necessarily interfere with ownership, um, but that's fine. And then they come together, um, fund the investment of uh, infrastructure, and maybe the first step is actually uh, to build and install a kind of community factory, which becomes the kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, it is what it is on the tin, a kind of this manufacturing, but also a, a sort of a local village institution for getting the support that you need or, or finding out an answer to a question or whatever it might be. Um, and use that community factory um, to design and procure uh, your own houses, which means, A, you can invest sweat equity, so it's radically more affordable. You're, but fundamentally, the most important thing is that the people doing the designing and the procuring, and you can get professionals in to do it, um, like architects, um, it is uh, that they are investing social capital as well as financial capital. And their fundamental purpose is not just to make a tradable financial asset, it's to make the place where they're going to live, where they're going to pay the heating bills, where they're going to bring up their children. So suddenly all these things that as architects we're interested in become economically viable. And in fact, the aim. All that. There you are, some propaganda. Um, and of course, what our aim is to develop not just kind of construction systems, but open source development models. So actually having... Um, developed uh, these sorts of models, our aim is then, um, and this is a slide all about basically pointing out how you're going to get real terms, of, real terms of economic prosperity as opposed to just debt. Instead of having to commute elsewhere, you can start you know, a business in your own house or whatever. Um, again, this idea of live work has been talked about for a long time, but we haven't, we've looked to an economy that has no interest in, in doing it. Um, and our aim is to completely open source all these models. And I'm always at pains to point out that there is absolutely nothing really innovative about what we're proposing here. This is how we built most houses throughout most of history. Uh, open source architecture is just a very fancy way of saying vernacular architecture, just with computers. Um, and I, actually, you know, that, that idea of the kind of traditional barn raising, um, you know, is how kind of settlers and things moved out west. But it, it's where changing the economic equation in the housing actually changes the outcome. So, for example, I can't say to Ambrose, can you come and spend two months of your life building a house with me? Because he'd be like, no, actually, I'm kind of busy. Um, but I could say to a whole bunch of my friends, can you all come for a weekend, and I'll bring pizza and beer, and we'll build a house. They'd be like, awesome, that's a lot better than what I had planned. So, um, actually, you can, you can take steps to, if you like, unlock this social economy and allow people to provide for themselves. And so we've open sourced not just the intellectual property of WikiHouse, but um, also uh, the deep ownership and governance of the organisation. Um, and uh, as a result of that, we've made this open trademark licence. So we're now, ha happily, frankly, because we're tiny, um, not the only ones developing um, these sorts of this, this sort of project. Uh, there's actually more than this. I think there's 13 at, uh, right now chapters around the world. Um, going, it's completely open. So this is one of the chapters is developing in Christchurch, New Zealand, um, looking at post-earthquake recovery housing. Ignore this bit. He's such a legend, that guy. Um, but to explain this, uh, one of the things that often people say to us at Wiki House is, um, oh, it must be really good for disaster response. Uh, and, and we're like, mm, probably not, because actually when a disaster hits, what you probably really want to do is just get your head down and mourn and survive. And um, with Christchurch, what happened, there's an amazing film about this, with Christchurch what happened was this, this amazing outpouring of citizen solidarity uh, when the earthquake struck, and they suddenly, out of nowhere, huge amounts of food and support arrived at village halls and, and schools and central locations, and loads of volunteers became this self-organising army. Um, uh, uh, to, to make sure people's needs were covered. But what happens again and again and again is that, and actually, by the way, globally, we're pretty good at this. The UN is pretty good at this disaster relief stuff. What happens again and again is that six months to a year down the line, they're still living in the emergency housing because the cranes and the capital and the debt don't come. And if they do come, it's usually a problem. It's usually gentrification or debt or exclusion. Um, and that's, to some extent, what's happened in Christchurch, where the cranes and the capital have come, but they've only built big-scale projects in the centre been completely bogged down in bureaucracy. So there's loads of people in the suburbs where there's still these blank spots of land, and the people are there, they want to help themselves, but the law and the industrial system doesn't enable them to do it. Um, 
And um, uh, rather, rather excitingly, actually, um, WikiHouse is now, thanks to the team over there, WikiHouse has now been written into the official housing policy of uh, Wellington, the capital city of, uh, of New Zealand, as part of their strategy long term for how they will build in resilience to these sorts of issues. Um, and this is just a cool little video illustrating this idea. Have a design. Anyone who says normal people can't design. So basically, it was what she said that really captured, um, really captured that for me. This is just some amazing footage. Um, I think these slides should have been in the other order um, uh, of, of of the earthquake um, when it hit there. Um, now the truth is, if that's what's needed there, the truth is actually that's kind of what we need everywhere. I mean, because if you look at this kind of uh, the, the global housing crisis, sure, in there they experience it as slow redevelopment. In the global south, they experience it as slums. Over here, we actually have a not a different, but not dissimilar housing crisis. It's just that we experience it as debt. Um, uh, and actually, in this environment, where if we look at the, the straightforward mathematics of urbanisation, straightforwardly, um, if we see citizens only as consumers of housing, and the professionals have to provide it, somewhere we're going to have to create enough money to do it. And Frank, as there's a, Robert Neuwirth says rather brilliantly, there is not a, a corporation, there is not a government, and there is not an aid agency who will be physically capable of doing it. And if, they, if, there, if, there is enough, if there is a bank who can create enough debt to do it, something has gone wrong again and we're going to crash. So we fundamentally actually have to see, find a way to make uh, bottom-up development uh, work. Um, and actually, that's in our interest, not just, if you like, in areas of scarcity, but in areas, relatively wealthy countries, where we're currently living in these, <coughs> frankly, incredibly deprived houses. So the, the, the fundamental aim, if you like, goes through just sort of housing and development. I think it speaks to um, our idea of democracy. When we talk about democracy, what we tend to mean is, generally, um, universal suffrage independent judiciary and free speech. And we tend to have this kind of quite black and white view of democracy, which is you are, you're not, you are, you're not. Um, and I think that's just really unhelpful, or quite wrong actually, which is that what we've done is we've seen democracy as an end rather than a means. And therefore we've justified saying, well, democracy is what we're building, but then we employ economic approaches and certainly industrial approaches, which are fundamentally undemocratic in the sense that a very small number of people do it to many other people. That doesn't need to be the case anymore. Um, and I think that is the great challenge. As I, as I sometimes put it, I think if you look back at what design really did, this, this strange industry called design in the 20th century, um, in the 20th century it democratised the consumption. So this idea that you know, everyone could have a washing machine, everyone could have Coca-Cola, everyone could have Ikea. And it did that really well. But I think what it's doing now, and I think the next challenge, is democratising production uh, and the capability to, to produce. And so if you like, WikiHouse is just kind of one part of, and we hope we'll to kind of go out into this, whatever you're kind of working on, the idea that collectively we could build a kind of Wikipedia for stuff, a global commons of design solutions um, that anyone can get access to, that they can replicate using multiple different materials maybe, but always low cost, low skill, low threshold, and very high quality and high performance. It's actually the only way that will ever diffuse sustainability solutions um, to everybody. 
Because at the moment, it's no use you making a passive house solution if it costs an absolute bloody fortune. You know. um, and so and the weird thing is about this is some of the technological questions that we could be usefully working on are strangely mundane. So arguably, probably more disruptive than what we're doing on housing is one thing we're necessarily doing is windows. We're trying to develop a CNC cuttable, uh, very high performance window. Now, of course, we can't make the glazing bit, but we've made a kind of frame, a customizable frame assembly kit that we haven't tested it yet, but we're developing it. But we hope it will give you very, you know, high, high, a level of energy performance that currently comes from a very expensive cust um, uh, proprietary product. But you can actually just get one of these things cut and, and make it for yourself for about a third of the cost. And there's prob you know, there's more people who need to replace their windows than need to replace their whole house, let's be honest. Um, other interesting mundane questions is in India over the next, by 2025, I think 50 million people are going to join the middle classes and they're going to want to use air conditioning and eat meat. So actually, if we're really serious about tackling problems like climate change, we need to develop these mundane solutions and diffuse them quickly. Um, you probably heard this statistic before. I can't read it very well. You know, there's 7.2 billion people in the world. Six billion have access to mobile phone. And let's say, I'll be honest, Coca-Cola. Probably 7.2 actually have access to Coca-Cola. Um, but only 4.5 billion have access to working toilets. So this is weird. It was a product of a whole load of uh, distribution things about markets. But for the first time, we may as well start using this to try and solve that. I, I, I wasn't sure how, quite how to finish this. There are three possible kind of endings. Uh, well, there's loads of possible endings. Um, one possible ending is to talk about the rise of new data capitalism, which is you hear people say, technology is going to save the world. It's like, well, you know, companies like Google give you some amazing free capabilities, but behind the scenes, they're incredibly centralized, hierarchical organizations who are accruing huge amounts of data. Uh, and that's got a price tag attached. That's why Nest, was the, the home sensing system, was recently bought for billions of pounds by Google. It was the data they were paying for. Um, and Facebook and things like that. And that's something we have to really look to, if you like, the institutions behind technologies. Uh, another kind of thing I'd love to go, and I really won't, is actually why this is not about buildings and cities. It's actually about farming and rural production. And there was a UN report out la uh, um, last year that absolutely nailed this about we're heading for a Monsanto future, so we need to radically democratise knowledge and tools for, for um, essentially organic farming at high yields. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that either. Um, what I want to talk about is just design, this question that um, I was set, if you like, for what this actually means for us. Um, how do we, in our, you know, as we're kind of going out, as a, how does our generation begin to say, no, actually, I don't, want to just design shadow gaps for rich people. Um, I actually want to go and sort of do something. Um, and it doesn't, it's, it's not a utopian ambition, it's just I may as well be useful, because if you're useful, money will probably eventually follow. Um, so where does design actually sit in this framework? Do we actually sit in the arts and crafts and, and section of the Guardian, you know, in the how to spend it bit of the economist? Um, no. Like, design is fundamentally an extraordinary way of thinking, and all architects are doing this all the time. They're connect when you're thinking about design, you're connecting economics, culture, aesthetics, ethics, um, philosophy. You know, you're, you're amalgamating and complexing all these various things in, in, in one place. So it's very weird that we've only, we've only been applying that amazing way of thinking to an incredibly narrow set of questions, like how should we make this real estate developer richer? Um, we can actually begin to participate in, in, if you like, by engaging with the economics uh, behind what's going on. We can begin to engage, I think, um, in hugely effective ways. And honestly, when I was in the third year, someone came up to me and said, um, it wasn't Ambrose, um, uh, someone came up to me and said, uh, Alistair, what are you doing? You're obviously a politician. Why are you becoming an architect? Um, I, ha I happened to be reading Buckminster from Fuller at the time, which was useful. Um, and this is a really a good example of this, which is a few years ago, um, uh, the highways agency announced that they were going to turn off the lights at, on, on motorways at night um, to save money and carbon. 
um, despite the fact that they knew statistically this was likely to lead to n number more deaths and injuries per year. Now this is actually a perfect microcosm of the impossible decision that we're giving to our politicians. These deaths or those deaths? You make the choice. Whereas, it's also, by the way, uh, a perfect illustration of what I call austerity environmentalism. When you speak to most architects and designers now, who, you know, I think most of us think of ourselves as being quite serious about climate change and sustainability, um, a lot of us are actually saddled on to this kind of activist idea that, oh no, it's, uh, it's, it's a kind of austerity thing. Stop eating meat, stop using your car, stop going on a holiday, stop having pets. Well, not only will we never sell that, but also it's, austerity environmentalism is deeply problematic. Because who gets to decide what's a luxury and what has actually progressed our quality of life? Because actually the truth is that although these ill-gotten gains, you know, may, although we may be mining uh, fossil fuels to bring our food, the truth is we've had massive leaps in life expectancy, massive leaps in women's rights. Um, only through development will we get the average number of children down to about two per family, which will stabilise out the, you know, the global population, etc. So we don't get to just say, oh no, uh, stop the world, I want to get off, and that's the sustainability answer. Um, we need to find a way for designers to, if you like, fundamentally pull the rug out from underneath these political equations. And actually this one, I don't think is that hard. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to take a stab at it. Uh, it's a bit weird. I spent time thinking about it. Do you want to? That's pretty smart. And that's been done in Germany because they can do that kind of thing. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, another straightforward solution um, is uh, to replace the bulbs with LEDs. And that payback is pretty quick. Um, and, uh, incidentally, it also has the effect of um, uh, making everyone look a bit prettier. <laughs> um, so I think if a government was really clever, they'd do it. And everyone would be like, Britain seems so much better these days. Um, but actually, no, my proposal for this was actually if you take a bit of capital and work with all the local farmers to install an anaerobic digester connected to a CHP unit, if you do the back of envelope maths, just from their manure and fertiliser, they can generate enough electricity in a year that you only need a percentage of it to light the motorway. They get to sell the rest of it, use the direct energy or sell back to the grid, and the payback time is about four or five years. So as a designer, you can bring an insight to these things that uh, a politician or a business person cannot do. I, it's why so many people are coming towards the idea that design is a central role. As Whether you call yourselves architects or whatever, as designers, you are possessed of the most extraordinary way of thinking, practically and creatively, about these sorts of um, problems. So for heaven's sake, choose a question that you think is worthwhile. Now, if I said to you, I ban you when you graduate from sending out a CV to an architecture firm. In fact, screw it, I ban you from sending out a CV. What question would you work on um, that really gives you flow, that you think is a, actually a really important question that somehow we need to ask, even if a job description doesn't exist for it, and even if you have to spend several years trying to find a way to make it pay you a wage, um, what problem would you go and work on, one that really gives you flow that you see as a great work? For heaven's sake, go and do it. Um, and if somebody says that's not architecture, fuck them. Thank you very much. Cheers, Arister. Um, we'll take some questions from the floor. Or beratings as well. Come on, I'll live on for a fight. Any questions? Ambrose has a list. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, please, please think of questions and challenges. Materiality means just to go through a few things, mistakes you made. Materiality means sense of material. Yeah, but who gets to define what sense of material is? I don't know. <laughs> Drawing is useful and it's used by poor architects. I know that. I've worked for I, I, I love to draw, by the way. No, no, no. I mean, like, technical drawing of buildings is done by architects who don't have large printers. Um, so that's useful. Um, and it's not 18th century. It's just better. Um, <laughs> and the thing that really struck me is that, and it, it, 
I think he has looked at the map quite strongly. Is that architecture and this building, this new fabulous building, as, uh, as, uh, as Bob Proctor described it, it's cracking, which I thought was a bit cracking. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, uh, no, there's a, there's a, there's a, it's a lovely job. No, yeah, so yeah, no, I, I'm not telling you. Are well educated, yeah. clean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? No, no, I know exactly. I know exactly what you mean. There's a, there's a really good quote about this, which actually said about advertising, which is you guys think very deeply about super, superficiality. Um, I, I, it's fine. I'm not saying don't do it, right? I, I'm saying you don't have the right to tell these guys that's the only option. Um, so I like, I, I think. Um, you know, keep working for the 1%. We work for the 1% as well, don't get me wrong. Right? You know, that's, a normal, that's always going to be part of the game. And if you want to sign up to the Eisenman belief that architecture's value is its very irrelevance, so the moment it becomes useful, then it's not architecture anymore, that's fine. You're an artiste. Fine. Do it. No, that's good. And I'm, I love art. Let art be. But don't fool yourself that that is a holistic view of what design can do. And also don't what we definitely shouldn't be doing is running our architectural institutions and our educational institutions as if that's what design is. Can I just add, this is not a question, it's just a comment. And I think it's really important for you guys who are trying to develop critical thinking skills. That, that this person, I just don't remember your name, Alistair. this person's <laughs> rhetorical provocation does not undermine the fundamental value of the analysis. No. So while we can address and critique certain rhetorical flaws or, you know, you said this, here's some propaganda, I would suggest or state that it's probably not the only instance of propaganda in the whole talk, but mm -hmm. I do think that the fundamental principle that both of you are sort of slightly arguing about is that what you are learning in architecture school, whether you're being taught about the 5% or whether you're being taught about a deeper or different kind of problem solving, is the ability to apply criteria and conceptual matrices yeah. and structuring your thought and organizing your collection of information, your analysis of information, your synthesis of information, and your deployment of information. But that guy yeah. over there is telling you you can do that in yeah. lots and lots of different ways. Yeah. And I would suggest or state that good. The yeah. more people that are designing chairs, houses, Etc. Great. The more people addressing, using design skills to address the raft of problems we have, great. Yeah. All I would say to you is, on top of that, the one thing that I think is important is that it not be ugly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so can now, I? Now, yeah. now, many of the proprietary window systems that I've seen and used in my life are pretty ghastly. Yeah. That one ain't no better looking, but I love it. <laughs> Trying to provoke us. Just wait till, it, wait till it's finished. <laughs> well, we're, we're, fully, we're fully going for the full Johnny Ive, you know. I just think you're trying to make a point, and the speciousness of some of the rhetoric used should not undermine it. I'd love you to pick me out on the specious and rhetoric because I would stand by any of it. Um, on your point, I completely agree with you. Um, and actually, even the most, um, if you like, uh, died in the war architect with a capital A. Um, I, what I argue is that your thinking is so much more sophisticated than you're treating it because the truth is what you're doing by ignoring all this stuff is um, locking yourself into a situation where you have to go out and do work which frankly is embarrassing to yourself because you know and, and so many architects do that so, oh, it's so poor quality it's so commercial and I say uh, you know the, the client changing the client if you like to the user is the person who will say actually I want the quality so in a way, I'm, I'm embracing that whole movement of architecture. And I also completely agree with you on beauty. There's a wonderful quote on this by the filmmaker John Luke Goddard, who said, um, it doesn't matter whether you choose ethics or aesthetics, because whichever you choose, you'll find the other one waiting for you at the end of the corridor. Um, and I, I fundamentally believe that. Um, 
but pick out the most specious of extra rhetorical point that I made. Yeah, people accuse me of being like Tony Blair sometimes. Well, uh, you want to be careful about that. <laughs> but I, I just think that rhetoric is a, is a wonderful device, and as long as we accept the No, but the important thing about rhetoric, and I, and I think this, I think, I think this is an important point. The important, no, no, the important thing about rhetoric is that actually, if someone scratches the surface and drills down, there's a real solid, informed discourse underneath it, and that's something that is one of the weird things because in architecture, it's really cool to be kind of off. And, and Rem has made the total, and I love Rem, but he's made the total genius of this, where he talks about quite radical issues, but one is a slightly kind of off way. It's very, very cool. The problem is to actually try and do something, you have to risk being uncool, because you have to try and go out and, and, and speak to, in plain English and actually you know, try and talk about what you're doing. And, and there, is a, there is a component of that where it becomes like almost accidentally becoming like a salesman, even though we're not selling anything, we're not making any profit from this. Um, the, whole, the human psyche is kind of split into four parts. One of those, one of the big parts is, is the novelty. One of the things we enjoy as humans is novelty. Mm. Our whole society is kind of predicated on that, on that basis. So that's where we get the consumer. You know, yeah. Like we just love novelty, and I love it. You know, I love seeing new things, getting new things. We just do it. It's just part of our human nature. Mm -hmm. Like this is great, but how does it? Does it fight against that? But how does it combat that? Because that is I wouldn't want to combat that. Does it combat that? Do you well, you're, you're trying to. Yeah. Do you think it does? But the reason that we have shit housing is because of that. It's because it's led by finance, by the government, yeah. by money, by consumers, yeah. by all that stuff. That's the reason. But that, that's not the same as the novelty thing, right? So, it's built into that. So when, when a family in Africa out, go out and buy a new bike, like. That's still novelty. It's still a new bike. They go, they're still going, wow. Like, that's what we did in the 50s when we had car, like new cars. It was like, wow. So, I mean, this is one of the interesting double plays with this is that in a way we're talking about very socially progressive things, but it's also recognising that that development in the 1950s, which that kind of culture of consumerism, it came from a very real impulse. And I, I, my, argument for, my argument, impulse is always don't fight against forces. Use them, but give people access to... Yeah, but, yeah, but people use them, but... At the end of the day, we're making big companies a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was great. We had Ubers, we had fridges, we had freezers. Yeah, that's all fine. But six years later, everything's in shit. Is it? I, I don't wish to be rude. I don't wish to be rude, but in my pocket, I have the answer to pretty much every factual no, I mean, question. I can. This is basically why, magic. Why, 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 why is it in millimeters squared for compression? You know? No, but this is this is great. I mean, that's a great point. But this is also because. Yeah, that, that's also a good point, by the way. Like, uh, that actually we take, we, uh, we also look at, for example, corruption in our own politics and things like that. But actually, it's so much less corrupt than, uh, you know, uh, African, a lot of African nations, for example. So you're right, uh, things are great. But equally, the question is, but, but why the is. The problem is contextualizing it somewhere else yeah. where we aren't ours. And that's, that's fine, but it's not really valid. So why do you think um, train tickets are so bloody expensive and train services so shit? I think the train service is good. <laughs> <laughs> You're the arch contrarian. You're the best person to be. <laughs> well, I mean, compared with what? Mm. So why is it that our iPhones are so awesome? Germany, Germany, France, no, but trains are so fast. Spain, for God's sake. Cross-national comparisons are absolutely the they're completely mean. Mm. We're different. Yeah. We do things different. You're here. Yeah, you're shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm weak. I'm shit. And violent. <laughs> so but, you ask, for example, the, the classic one that I would say there is, you ask the question, who makes cities? Mm -hmm. And your answer is housing. And my, I think it's more complex than of that. Of course it is. One, but the, this is the problem. How, how, how do you talk about everything without talking about something? Well, I'm not, I'm again, I if you want to have a conversation question. about hospitals and schools and procurement thereof, I'm gay. <laughs> question about uh, novelty and I think the answer to it is that if you democratize production, then there's a better chance of people having an array of choices that might be more carefully calibrated to their own desires rather than 
those which are created by Navitar, we have undergone a 70 year psychological experiment where you know rational people see a car and they think, oh God, if I had one of those, I might get laid. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, oh, if I drank that, I might get laid. Yeah. I mean, that's basically. You know, and then, this is not an accident <laughs> that we find ourselves nope. in this place. And his point that we have the possibility as designers to go in and work on the software that ch can change things. And I don't think that's a, it is, we are in a watershed moment, and old, dead, nearly dead people like me mean shit in that. You in architecture, you're a baby. Can go out and you can unsettle the situation. Cedric Price's questions mm. are still relevant. Mm. He was looking for a place in the world where the old architecture of the capital lake didn't, didn't have any purchase in, in society. And you guys are, have that possibility of being those people. Yeah, no question. Drag. It's only the last short time. <laughs> I was just wondering about the nature of the Yeah, they could already do that bit. That's fine. Okay, there's the two questions you just asked banded in that are two super important questions. The first question you just asked is, as I interpret it, is about in, this institutional clash. And another aspect of the institutional clash is this myth of originality, which I, I, hopefully I've just showed that even within architect, I mean, of course, most vernacular architecture was all based on copying. Even within architecture, it began fundamentally as a copy and paste function. If you walk around your studio, you'll see these things being copied. And this is totally unfair that you've had this institutional thing put on you that says, you must be original. The more original you are, the more marks we'll give you. Which is really weird when actually design is really successful. Instead of trying to reinvent the wheel every time, you do what Linus Torvalds calls be lazy like a fox. And just take what already works and hack it for your needs. And that's actually smart design. And this will be something that will change. Attitudes are changing around that in the same way, way that they've been changing around YouTube and licensing and the internet. But it took people like Larry Lessig you know, people started doing that with videos and Wikipedia articles. It took people like Larry Lessig to write the CC license, which gives people different ways of uh, sharing their content under different contracts to legitimise these new ways of doing, um, if you like, as the cracks appear in the old institutions. That was the first question. The second question was about labour economies, right? Um, is there, no? Reframe, reframe what your real question was in terms of... Curated. <laughs> don't. Uh, the first point is don't confuse democratic with uh, ad hoc. It's not. It's not the same thing, right? Democratic fundamentally is not the absence of structure. It's as fu it's fundamental uh, uh, a presence of appropriate structures. Um, for governance, control, ownership, etc. So ideally, your ideal systems have self-monitoring behaviours built into them. Now, actually, Wikipedia, people love to say, oh, there's a bad article on Wikipedia, but it's amazing how few, few there are um, on Wikipedia, you know, given the vast amount of knowledge that's on there. So um, actually, these systems, this is one of the great design... That is a design challenge. Which is the liability question. Yeah. So this is where we, and exactly the same thing, we have, to rep, we have to find a way to build in those protections and standards. So at the moment, the whole of WikiHouse is done on a disclaimer basis, which says this carries no liability. You've got to check this and do this yourself. Right? And it's a big problem, because open source, open source software, if it fails, someone loses money. If open source hardware fails, people lose limbs. Um, 
But on the long run, you know that parametric design tool, for example, it's completely possible you could codify a series of languages where you can say um, the wind is this much in this location. And you can set in, for example, a max span limit, which is the most a, sp a structure can do. Now that, and in fact, not only is that possible, but it starts to completely reframe our whole attitude towards standardization and safety checking. At the moment, there's two schools of thought in open source hardware. There's the mental libertarians who are like, I want to do whatever I want, I'm going to 3D print a gun. And on the other side, <laughs> uh, on the other side, uh, you know, people are saying, no, actually, those safety standards existed for a reason. But here's the problem, which is if I make one product um, uh, and we get it certified, you know, BSA by type or whatever, um, that's fine until someone makes one adaption, one, one fork, as it's called, right? Uh, and, you say, yeah, you can't trust the quality of it. So what you need to do somehow is to systematize the quality of it so that we're going to move to more to, like I showed with the planning thing, more towards rules-based, which is as long as it's within these rules set, written by an expert, by a professional, um, it's going to work. But if it steps outside the rules, it no longer works. So actually, it's a slow progress where we move from rigid to sort of a, a flexible or pliable regulatory and trust-based systems. Um, but it is, that is one of the central questions behind this whole movement. Uh, in terms of online reputation. And there's people with some really misconceived ideas about trying to turn reputation into a kind of currency. Um, you know. I would say most... I would say, no, I would say it's both, right? It's like, if this is all, if like unlocking craft, find me an architect who says I want to spend less, less time really thinking about what I'm designing for whom and, and how it's made and more time worrying about safety re regulations. Um, so, and this is another one of the myths, um, if you like this idea, oh, it's going to be bad for architects. It might be bad for carpenters, maybe. But, um, it, it's going to be about no, it's not right because fundamentally, right now, architecture's dilemma is that we've we're, we've got unpaid interns sitting late into the night doing two D drawings of a detail that's been done many times before, probably better, and thank God they're protected by a big insurance mechanism. Um, uh, and then down the road, there's another unpaid intern doing the same detail, you know, at the same time, all because we're not sharing. So actually, commons are really good bases for economic shared economy of prosperity. So I would say with Wikipedia, sure, um, Wikipedia might have put Encarta and Britannica out of business, but it's put millions of more people into business. Yeah, but so what, what we're talking about, and that, and that will still be there, because these people, what we're finding, you know that graph I showed where, you know, how do we work for 100 people in a year instead of one? What we're finding is when you give people the power to, to do, even if it's completely free, they can do it for themselves, they say, look, look, I couldn't afford to hire you for a month, but can I come and afford you to hire you for two days to solve this problem? So they still hire that expertise in your head. So you will still need to learn that expertise. That's the first thing. And secondly, almost this is like a shift, and Cedric Price talked about this, where instead of us producing objects, we produce the means by which others can make objects. So we're still doing that design exercise, it's just easier for people to replicate and copy. Um, and, and yeah, there's a kind of very interesting, um, you know, also culture shift in architecture where it used to be that the greatest legacy an architect could leave to the world was, a, you know, a beautiful building with their name carved into it, um, like this one. I think in, uh, on where we're going, I think it might be that the best legacy we can leave is not an object, but a way of doing um, that other people can then carry on. And, and, yeah. No, it's the opposite, yeah. Yeah, but the weird thing is architects love to wax lyrical about the vernacular and how beautiful it is and replicating Georgian houses. And yet that, those beautiful designs came from uh, this emergent process of copying and then adapting. And they say, well, actually, we don't have that material here, or we have a different law here, so it tweaks and changes. And so, you know, I'm not stopping you going to do whatever you want, but I'm just saying, actually, most stuff is, is really successful designs, like the sash window, 
or do you remember Sturt's cartwheel? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of these designs, they evolved over time by, you know, multiple iterations and just slight tweaks and copies, and I think yeah, that's good. I think what he's saying is that the novelty will become part of the production, so you're, like, you're a designer, I find it hard to believe that you can't see yeah, a novelty in production. production. Uh, not, not, no, not necessarily. Some people will interpret that as the joy, and there is this thing called the IKEA effect, yeah. which is this thing where people become more emotionally attached to a thing because they made it. Um, and that's nice. That's fine. That's, yeah, um, that, it, that, that's fine. But no, the, it's far more mundane than that. Which is straightforwardly, it becomes economic for buildings to respond to their context instead of being one size fits all things. Which again, most architects seem to be trying to work towards anyway. I don't think it should be something that people are afraid of. I think it's a huge opportunity. Well, in a way, right, a lot of this stuff will happen. And I don't wish to be the kind of scaremonger in the room. But sooner or later, Google just bought Nest, which are these sensors where you can you know, control the energy infrastructure in your house for a huge amount of money. And they will, they will give us all these products and they'll be harvesting all our data and that'll be nice. And, and it's only a matter of time before they realise that this tawdry little property market is screwed and that they could unlock a huge data market by seeing houses primarily as places where people live. Um, and, 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 and they will come into this space. They will do this stuff. But the point is, fundamentally, behind it will be this incredibly centralised kind of thing where Google will um, you know, know and everything. So in a way, what we're kind of talking about is maybe we need to, to blend... Like design of democracy. And Benjamin Franklin was such a cool guy in this one because he, you know, he invented loads of cool things. He never patented any of them because he saw the fundamental purpose of them as being if you come up with a good idea, everybody should have them. And the designs he produced weren't just objects, they're the famous ones, but he was responsible for implementing one of the world's, uh, not one of the world's first, one of America's first fire brigades. You know, which is a kind of, it's a civic design system in a way. So it's just this idea that maybe. Uh, because design has this ability to bring in not just market issues, but you know political issues and questions about the civic good, yeah. um, we could do that. Yeah, and I think if you're, you're not scared of it, if you're right, like, it is going to happen anyway, so mm. why not act? Right? Well, we, to be involved. we choose. I mean, I can't do diddly, right? Now, there's other people working but we can't do diddly, but collectively we can. If you don't think this is a good idea, don't do it. But if you do think this is a, a, a interesting way of working, then... You know, apply it to the, what you're really interested in. I mean, it's, it's, I'm not forcing anyone to do anything. You know, open source design, when you apply it globally, it shows the mental that's that, that sort of the answer to cities in the future. Presumably, well, 99% of those people don't have access to computers. And do you have access to mobile phones, though, by the way? And soon they'll have access to smartphones. Um, so that that idea of oh that we've got technology and they don't is dissipating yeah. quickly. Um, however, your point is a really good one. Uh, the in the sense of I really hope that you guys, when we're having this conversation, as it seems you have, um, infer the, if you like the principles of the approach rather than the specific thing. Because a lot of people say, "Why well, are you so interested in plywood?" Right? We're not. We, don't, I mean, we, we look like we're fetishists, but it's just we saw a disruption we could make now. So we did it, and we thought we have got to start somewhere, so we'll start there. Now, actually, down the line, I, the fundamental open material might be Earth, finding really sophisticated ways to build with Earth. Um, the truth is that the system we've developed now, we know, we're pretty confident that it's disruptive in Western economies where labour is expensive but materials are relatively cheap and available, but is not is as good as useless in Africa, where the opposite is true. Um, but equally, the same set of principles could be applied... Um, in terms of open sourcing solutions, etc. And actually, that would be a really productive way of going ahead. And I think a lot of organisations are realising this from, from our traditional, what I call the burger and salad approach, where it was big, big bad business over here, and then there's charity and pro bono and aid over here. And the problem with this, what, what Peter Buffett has called, who's Warren Buffett's son, is called the charitable industrial complex, is that this has fundamentally no interest in putting itself out of business. So uh, it, it's kind of like... Um, throwing someone a life raft but then filling up the pool with a hose with the other hand um, and so actually this idea of democratising capability 
uh, in order to kind of allow you know give people capabilities is a huge issue. And uh, you know I love the economist the March of Sen and his idea that freedom is not just the legal permission to do something; it's your actual cap real capability to do a thing. So by building capabilities, we are actually building freedoms, um, which is why you know we uh, very nobly called the book Right to Build. You know. Although there is a legal permission side of it as well, which is why we're always you know, poking away at the government to change housing policy. Yeah, sorry, you guys you say that um, people like eventually will be able to upload their own designs. No, they can do that now. They can do that anyway. Yeah. How Just do badly. you establish like, when people upload very similar designs to each other and where does the money go? And who no, 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 no. So the IP is free. No money goes to anyone. anyone. How does now, there is an interesting point in your question, which is on the long run, the, the, the fundamental business model for this is that you create commons that we all benefit from using. Yeah. Um, and this thing I said is that even an, an Arduino and MakerBot have proven this, which is even if you give away all your IP for free, there'll still be some people who find it easier to come to a professional and buy kits or buy your time as an architect over and above that which is free. So actually there's a pretty healthy business model in there without costing any of the thing. On the long run though, we would like to think about um, sort something like what you're suggesting, which is like a tipping thing, which is voluntary money, which is if you've taken this design and it's, it's saved you money or made you money, please um, send a tip back to the designers. Now, at the moment, as you say, that's untenable because yeah, you can't trace the intellectual property. One of our timber bolt-free joints is nicked from 14th century Japanese wood joinery techniques. We haven't heard from their lawyers, but we're not going to be sending them any money either. <laughs> um, so... Uh, what we would be interested in developing now is a kind of, I don't know if you're familiar with the platform GitHub, um, it's basically, it's the engine for open source code and it tracks um, every modification that gets made to a thing, so theoretically it's completely, if we had the resources we'd build it now, um, it's one of our funding goals, uh, to build a kind of GitHub-like architecture for 3D things that can track all the changes, assign an author, so if you took a product, said I donate £500, it would then go and distribute that tip among the appropriate designers, but um, in truth, that's a long way off yet. I still, I, I still don't understand though where the, like, how the architect then makes the money, like how the income. Well, you said so eventually, maybe you know, we can be more. Like, yeah, well, that's honestly that's yeah. already happening to us, which is we're giving away all of this, and, and WikiHouse Foundation is obviously it, kind of, the Commons are all held in a non-profit pool, which is everybody's, but us as zero zero. Um, if you like, people are banging on the door saying, I want to commission a house off you. How much fees can I give you? And the result is, as I say, that over this year we'll have about 10 clients as opposed to one. So we're not exactly getting to the 100 yet. But um, slow progress, you know, baby steps. But no, no, that's happening. The door is finally, after two years of kind of doing this on a shoestring, thank, frankly, thanks to um, A00 investing it, um, you know, in kind and, and others, uh, not just zero zero, and all the book contributors, momentum engineering, lots of people, um, and uh, what I lovingly call the bullshit economy, which is like museums and, and people who just w are interested in the idea, and who essentially fund us to build a prototype for their exhibition or whatever, which is great, and we love them for it. Um, uh, finally, we're getting to a stage now where we can begin to imagine a way to keep beans on our our, our plate. And, but the point is you, right now, as an architect, could set up a thing and start using the system. And Bauman Lyons already have. So Bauman Lyons, really early on, took WikiHouse, they adapted it, uh, and they built, they built a sort of walker's shelter in Yorkshire. Um, and, and they could easily yeah, become an architecture practice operating um, through WikiHouse. Thank you very much. Will we continue in the last part?